Well, welcome back. Thanks for being here for our second panel. Um, panel number two is on humanitarian aid and relief. And we have three panelists and a discussant. Our first speaker will be Caroline, Carolina Kutsira. Then we will have Reza Ostapenko. And finally, Matt Polly. And afterwards, the discussant, Rory Finnan, will offer comments. And then we will open up the floor for questions. Carolina. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, good morning, I think still. Um, first, I need to admit that it feels very good to be here. I think I'm not the only one in the audience uh, for whom this is like the first uh, in-person conference since what feels like forever. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, and um, I will probably read my dis read my presentation and a little bit more that I would like to. And one of the reasons is that I just came from New York like half an hour ago. Um, so there is a serious possibility that I will just collapse somewhere in the middle um, of my presentation or like right after. Um, so I wouldn't like this uh, to happen. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, I would like to start my presentation in a sort of unusual way, um, at least for me. Um, and I would like to start it with some kind of methodological disclosure and reflect on my research process that in the last four years uh, took me to seven countries. Um, this is, of course, Ukraine, uh, United States, Canada, Poland, Austria, and Germany. Uh, where I worked in various archives, counter archives, private archives, uh, I work with atrocity files, testimonies with survivors, memoirs, um, I talk with activists, uh, very often in their private homes, uh, I participated in communal uh, commemorations, um, and last but not least, uh, a part of my research was, was fieldwork conducted in uh, Ukrainian countryside. Um, in other words, uh, my dissertation research, and I'm going to talk about my dissertation research today, mirrored the decades-long process of the formation of the Holodomor narrative, processes that were transnational, uh, multidirectional, and heterogeneous in their form. Um, so throughout my research, um, I've been dealing with um, all sorts of archival silencing that I think that many of us who study um, who study Holodomor uh, kind of cope with. Um, and I'm thinking about moments when uh, famine um, is not really mentioned in any documents, when we have uh, different, um, um, different words that describe what was like developing, developing in Ukraine. Uh, I'm talking about documents with severe discursive cleansing. Um, I'm talking about silencing in forms of destruction of documents. Um, I'm talking about erasure. I'm talking about displacement. And, uh, and I think that all of these elements are especially visible in the presentation today, which is about the work of the Ukrainian Committee um, for Starving Ukraine, whose documents were um, stolen from Lviv um, by the retreating German army during the Second World War, abandoned somewhere in Poland, um, and kept um, hidden by Polish archivists until the like, 1990s. So throughout this research process, I kept asking myself, what these dissonant systems of knowledge production tells us about uh, our understanding of Holodomor? Or more precisely, how does this peculiar dynamic between power and historical erasure um, informs the study of Holodomor? Um, so my doctoral dissertation, uh, which I'm completing right now, combines historical and sociological approaches to the study of long-term legacy of political violence, um, and more precisely of the famine of 1932-33, from 1932 till present, uh, by focusing on ways in which various communities of discourse in and outside of the Soviet Union use differing, differing kinds of questions, invoke dis distinct historical narratives, and provided forms of evidence, my research documents changing global politics of recognition and accountability that inform the processes of the making of the Holodomor. My dissertation argues that the denial of famine was not just a thing in the past, 
um, but became this powerful force that has continued to shape societal relations, historical representations, and politics of accountability. The faith recognition of the famine, um, I further argue in my dissertation, re-traumatized the victims and blocked the societal proce processes of coming to terms with this repressive past. Um, and perhaps uh, my today's uh, talk is the best illustration of this process. Um, the formation of an early response to the famine in the form of humanitarian narrative based on a public information campaign uh, reveals this tension between global and national, the political and legal fields uh, for knowledge pr production and recognition. This pre presentation situates the activism and impact of small-scale aid committees working for the starving Ukrainians within broader interwar humanitarianism in Europe. It argues that the official denial of the famine uh, by the Soviet government triggered the deployment of an alternative narrative that would offer evidences about the developing disaster, generate empathy for the starving, and attempt to delegitimize the Bolshevik rule. According to it, the famine in Soviet Ukraine was seen uh, in political and national terms, um, a part of a more extended pattern of violence against the Ukrainians. This particular form of humanitarian narrative was based on what I call um, in my project national compassion, a moral duty and obligation to act that united Ukrainians of different backgrounds um, and across borders. So the work of various Ukrainian organizations that were um, 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 that were dealing with this, uh, or that were leading the public awareness campaign in Galicia and across Central Europe, and I will focus on Galicia and Central Europe in today's talk, resemble the so-called ad hoc humanitarianism, frequently organized along national lines. And by national lines, I mean values, ideas, and feelings that form the thesis of national uh, or form the basis of national solidarity. Yet, what is really interesting here, those national lines were kind of distributed through transnational networks. Um, thus, uh, the activists of many of those communities often escape this simplistic perception of interwar humanitarianism as, um, um, uh, as a movement, ex as exclusive movement of global, uh, global players on some international level. Um, so this story of ad hoc humanitarians takes me back to Galicia uh, when it all began. So the pivotal role in creating these transnational solidarity networks and national habits of feeling played the Ukrainian Civil Committee for Saving Ukraine. Formed by the prominent Galician Ukrainian leaders, uh, it, it quickly took charge in organizing Ukrainians across borders in countering the Soviet, Soviet denial of the famine. The Ukrainian committee worked in close collaboration with the Ukrainian National Democratic Alliance and founded in 1925, uh, uh, UNDO's main political goal was to unify Ukrainian lands and demand the right uh, to self-determination for Ukrainians. UNDO's work involved creating and sustaining the associational life of the Ukrainian community under Poland by supporting organized societies uh, such as uh, Prosvita, cooperatives, credit unions, and economic institutions. Vasil Mudry, Milena Rodnitska, Zinovi Pelensky, and Dmitro Levitsky, the most important Ukrainian political and cultural leaders in Galicia, became the founding group of activists. The establishment of the Ukrainian committee was thus deeply embedded in the existing networks and political activism of Ukrainians in Galicia. So in the founding moment, um, and uh, in, in the founding document that, that I mentioned in the title of my presentation, the 34 local socio-cultural associations expressed their support for the establishment of the Ukrainian committee. Among them were educational associations like the Shevchenko Scientific Society, the Women's Association in Lviv, various sport associations and economic organizations, all with some direct and indirect ties um, to UNDO. The first announcement published by the Ukrainian committee called for the national unity of all Ukrainians against, and I quote, the communist dictators in Moscow who led to starvation, the valley, the holodu, of our brothers living in Dnipro, Kubany, and Don. The mass deaths from starvation and numerous cases of cannibalism were a result of the failed political economy led by Moscow, the massive export of grain from Soviet Ukraine, and the mass terror experienced by civilians. 
So the distribution of information uh, was a key task of the Ukrainian committee in countering the Soviet denial of the famine, while at the same time generating national compa compassion and helping the starving. And I quote, um, hundreds of thousands of our brothers have already died from starvation last winter and spring, Vasil Mudri wrote in his book, Likolitia Ukraine. Still, the coming winter and spring, so the coming winter of uh, 1934 and spring um, 1934, were bringing them even more worse starvation. According to Mudri, the Soviet go government was contradicting itself by officially denying the famine and banning the Western correspondents from visiting the famine areas. However, at the same time, the government claimed that the famine across Ukraine would, be not, uh, would not be a particular misfortune to the country. This means, Mudri concludes, that they want this famine for Ukraine. If not, why do they define it? So, Liholitia Ukraine, uh, a book, uh, a book which, I, which I accessed in the Library of Congress, was one of the first attempts to counter the Soviet denial of the famine and interpret the developing catastrophe as a form of political violence. It, was also, it also played a crucial role in informing Ukrainians across Galicia about the famine and the Soviet system in general. The famine in Ukraine, Modri argues, demonstrated the failure of the Bolshevik economy and was a direct result of the Moscow's terror of Ukrainians. The book is thus a history of the causes of the famine linked to the vision of the USSR as an imposed political system and in a form of economic op oppression that destroyed this kind of link people have with land, but also destroyed the exi existing webs of networks between people. The terror of the famine and the misery of the starving Ukrainians was thus the final stage uh, in the history of subjugation and violence experienced by Ukrainians. We cannot observe this colony, Montre writes. We need to do everything we can do to organize aid for our brothers, and we need to stop this bloody action against the Ukrainian nation. This is our national responsibility. From its founding moment, the Ukrainian committee aspired to become a leader in distributing knowledge of the famine to Galicia, across Central and Western Europe, and in North America. In August 1933, its members established close institutional connections with Metropolitan Andrei Szeptycki, the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, and Cardinal Theodor Initzer of Vienna, one of the prominent Central European Catholic leaders making international appeals to help the starving. Members of the Ukrainian committee raised their humanitarian concerns and lobbied international organizations such as the League of Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the Congress of European Nationalities. And I feel like most, most of us know this part of the story. Um, one of the first actions of the members of the Ukrainian Committee was to establish a network of field offices that would distribute knowledge of the famine at district and village levels. On August 14, 1933, members of the Ukrainian committee distributed an announcement calling for the creation of a committee in every district town of Galicia. In the letter signed by Rudnitska and Palensky, the Ukrainian committee called for all Ukrainians living in lands under Polish control to unite by spreading knowledge about the famine through public pro protests. All district committees, uh, formed of seven to nine people, were to be supervised by the committee in VIP. The goal of these district committees were organizing um, local uh, meetings and church services, publishing brochures, sending letters, organizing press conferences, and keeping in touch with Ukrainian deputies to Polish parliament. This idea to self-organize through the formation of district committees found fertile ground. Just a week uh, later, the first district committees uh, were created, uh, or the first district committee was created in the town of Bibka around 30 kilometers south, southeast of Lviv. Soon it was followed by Berezhane, Bucha, Zorzhokva, Lutsk, Zbarash, and many, many other places. While calling on all Ukrainians to unite, the leaders of the Ukrainian committee had in mind a more extended action than simple self-organization on local ground. In early September, they announced the need to organize a day of mourning and protest to raise conscience about the famine and publicly denounce the Bolshevik regime. Together with the Greek Catholic, Catholic hierarchies, they set October 29th as the day of mass action across Galicia. However, despite, um, despite this, um, um, the actions the, um, and, and, the, and the requests sent by Ukrainian parliament, parliamentary representatives and UNO members, the Polish Ministry of Internal Affairs refused to grant permission to organize public events. 
Such simultaneous gatherings around strong feelings of sympathy and grief towards peasants starving in Soviet Ukraine in all district towns of Galicia at the same time were perceived as a clear manifestation of Ukrainian nationalism that could pose a direct challenge to the Polish authorities. As Rogers Brubaker states, nationhood manifests itself in events, and the power of nationalism lies in its ability to create groups. Under these circumstances, the members of UNDO decided nonetheless to carry on the action and move it entirely into churches and local Ukrainian community buildings. Um, so this organiza organization of the day of mourning and protest was, like was closely coordinated between Lviv and various district offices. Um, and I don't have time to kind of look at this more, uh, more in more detail, but I would like to mention the town of Buchach or the district of Buchach, uh, about or around like 130 kilometers uh, southeast of Viv. So in Buchach, uh, for example, uh, a town on the Zbruch River, approximately 80 kilometers from the border with Soviet Ukraine, the famine was not just some distant news, but a real catastrophe experienced daily through the influx of refugees from Soviet Ukraine um, and through like very uh, close like family histories or stories. This is why in the Buchaj district, uh, the commemorative events were organized both in the main town and in every village in the district, uh, altogether 45 villages. Specially designed posters hung in public spaces uh, and funeral service um, in memory of the deceased um, took place in churches uh, or was performed simultaneously in all churches in the district. According to the organizers and the documents of the Ukrainian committee, more than uh, 6,000 people participated in this commemoration to express what was framed compassion for our brothers, Spirituvania Drabartam in Ukraine. Um, the scale of the day of mourning and protest went beyond the Ukrainian lands under Polish control, and a wave of commemorations across Europe was reported on October 29th. In Hamburg and Berlin, Ukrainians were joined by the German associ association Bruder in Not. Lectures, concerts, and church services were organized across Belgium, France, Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. Outside of Lviv, uh, two cities became the most important centers for countering the Soviet denial of the famine. The first one was Prague. Uh, when the Czechoslovakia Committee of Rescue to Ukraine was organizing the day of mourning and protest, um, and during this day, Olga Bochkovsky, a, a prominent uh, Ukrainian leader, uh, gave a lecture. But there was also like another association, uh, namely Ukrainian Women's Association, uh, led by Professor Rusova, who also contributed um, uh, contributed uh, to this event. Also, in a lengthy article written for the Trezov, Rusova warned that information is the only tool through which the situation in Great Ukraine can uh, get better. The famine, Rusova stress, is not created by natural causes, lack of harvest or climate issues. No, it is created artificially by the political situation in which the Ukrainian nation lives under Moscow Bolsheviks. Next to Prague, Bucharest uh, was the most active city in distributing information about developing famine. The Ukrainian committee formed by Dr. Vasil Trepke at Metro um, Herodot played a leading role in spreading information about the influx of refugees escaping the Soviet Union via the Dnes River and calling for the formation of a special committee dedicated to helping the refugees. And again, in this case, um, as in you know, Rusova case, um, the pages of Trezup um, kind of uh, expose us to um, very dreadful um, stories that took place on the Dnest River. Um, okay. um, the many local committees also uh, had numerous opportunities to meet during international conferences, such as the Congress of European Nationalities in Bern, um, but also in other places, uh, among them Vienna. Uh, where under the auspices of Card Cardinal Theodor, Theodor Initzer, the Interconfessional and Supranational Congress was organized on December 16, 17, 1933. Since late August 1933, Cardinal Initzer had been one of the most active spiritual leaders distributing information about the famine. His appeals were reprinted in major Western newspapers, uh, but also major newspapers in the region. He was also in close contact with the Metropolitan of Galicia, Count Andrei Szczeptycki, the members of the Ukrainian Committee, and the leaders of other organizations working for famine relief as well. One of them was uh, Ruslan Hilfe, uh, Hilfe's Action for the Hungerden in Ruslan, uh, based in Vienna and working to provide uh, food aid uh, to starving Jews in the Soviet Union. 
Uh, I think that the story of the uh, of the Congress in Vienna and various organizations that um, participated in, in the Congress is pretty well known. Um, but it's interesting in the context of my presentation to note that the Congress was just the beginning of Initzer's activism um, when it comes to distribution knowledge uh, of the famine. At the beginning of 1934, he was gifted a photo album by Alexander Wienerberger, an Austrian engineer who was working in Kharkiv in 1933. These photos sent to Austria via the diplomatic mail in October 1933 are rare access accessible visual evidence of the famine. Throughout 1934, Wienerberger, supported by Initzer, gave late lectures in Austria about the famine, and in August 1934, his photos were included in the 16-page long brochure, Russland vs. Wirklisist. Initzer became a major anti-Bolshevik spiritual leader in Austria and fre frequently referred back to the famine um, of the 1930s to show the immoral character of the regime, while at the same time, he was also turning into fascism and supporting the call for unification of Germany and Austria, and clearly um, the history of the famine was instrumental um, in his own propaganda. So in my conclusion, um, I would like to, uh, to talk a little bit uh, about you know, the significance of this interwar uh, ad hoc humanitarianism. So the work of this Ukrainian com of, the, of the Ukrainian committee and various Ukrainian committees uh, in the region um, travel beyond its time and geographical constraints. What was started in Viv by a small group of Galician leaders in late July 1933 became a transnational movement that united Ukrainians across borders for decades to come. Their definition of the famine as a politically motivated atrocity committed by the Bolshevik authorities was formed in response to the Soviet denial of this catastrophe and a broader international indifference. Ukrainian leaders did not see the famine as an exceptional event or a failure of nature, but a part of a broader patterns of violence against peasants and the forced subjugation of Ukrainians to the imposed political system. In the 1930s, such political understanding of famine as political violence was novel. Thus, it did not find fertile ground beyond a small group of activists. The quest for international recognition of the famine was sacrificed to real political consideration. This did, this did not stop Ukrainians from providing aid to the starving. In the context of overwhelming denial, the only humanitarian narrative that could emerge was that of national compassion directed towards uniting Ukrainians around a moral obligation to act. The language of kinship was deployed to help the starving brothers in the motherland and further bring Ukrainians together across borders. For the readers of these various Ukrainian associations, the famine was instrumental in developing networks of compassion that would unite groups of very different political backgrounds, uh, confessions, and geographical identification. The narrative of national compassion was a transnational project that aimed at bringing together Ukrainians living in Galicia, European exile communities, and the North American diaspora. Letters, telegrams, and news articles sent from Lviv called on exile communities to integrate and unite around countering the Soviet denial. In 1934 and subsequent years, for example, the Ukrainian Women League of America formed the Emergency Relief Committee for Starving Ukraine that started um, a large-scale information campaign in North America to lobby for the family's recognition and appeal for food aid. Throughout the 1930s, the various committees kept collecting food, uh, funds, um, sending letters uh, to newspapers, and reaching out to international politicians. However, the most important legacy of the Ukrainian committee lies in Galicia. The wide participation in the day of mourning and protest contributed to the distribution of information about the famine among all Ukrainians. The tragic events taking place in Soviet Ukraine were shared by everyone. On October 29, in every district town um, and village of Galicia, peasants, clerks, educators, priests, and community leaders gathered together to mourn the deaths of co-nationals. In Galicia, commemorating the victims became a national obligation and the famine and a national tragedy. The day of mourning and protest set a commemorative pattern for the decades to come when Ukrainians living in diaspora would mourn the victims of the famine at church services and through public protests. In the North American context, the commemoration of the famine was thus not a simple result of some Cold War era instrumentalization of famine history and memory, but a continuation of practices already established in Galicia in 1933. Thank you.
just like to start by saying that I'm so profoundly grateful to be here. Um, it's an absolute honor. And thank you so much to the organizers, to Dr. Mattingly, to Mr. Stetichka. No? OK, good. <laughs> to Dr. Finnan. Um, it, it really is an, an honor, and I can't stress that enough. Um, so just for context, my ongoing doctoral research is focused on the rescue activities, motivations, and methods, and moral psychology of, eth of Ukrainian rescuers of Jewish victims of the Holocaust. In spotlighting acts of heroic altruism, my work explores the question of why, under an occupation where rescuing was punishable by death, some bystanders were able to become rescuers, while others, amongst them even some ethical, non-prejudiced people, were not. I also inquire into the how of rescue, evaluating the methods that rescuers uh, under, uh, enacted, the considerations they made, how they interacted with the naturally occurring and man-made structures and tools at their disposal, how they relied on familial and communal resources, and how uh, the success and the ethicality of any given rescue operation could be affected by socioeconomic, political, and religious factors. Um, set against the background of a broader exploration of Ukrainian wartime behavior from collaboration to uh, complaisance to resistance to Nazi empire building, my research am aims to encapsulate the full complexity of life under occupation, the divergent realities of the Holocaust in Ukraine and the shades of gray in the historical record. And so this paper on reciprocated rescue represents part of my doctoral research. Ukrainian rescuers, like rescuers across occupied Europe, sought to rationalize their actions both during the war and after the fact of having rescued, so after the war. And this entailed finding excuses that seemed sufficiently logical and convincing to justify the decision to risk their lives and the lives of their family members to rescue. And I reiterate that in occupied Ukraine, rescue rescuing Jews was punishable by death, but not only of the rescuer, but often of the rescuer's family, at least according to local legislation imposed by the Nazis. Of all the self-ascribed motivations cited by Ukrainian rescuers of Jewish victims of the Holocaust, from Judeophilia to faith to parental instinct, amongst the most powerful were feelings of gratitude and indebtedness to a victim for past acts of kindness. While gratitude, an overwhelmingly positive emotion, and indebtedness, a potentially negative emotion, are distinct feelings, both are precursors to reciprocation or repayment. And remarkably, uh, remarkably, even in this landscape where the cost of reciprocation, so one's life, could exceed the value of the original gesture immeasurably, and failure to rescue was largely devoid of social stigma, as rescuer altruism benefited from no widespread social reinforcement during the war, some non-Jews felt such gratitude or indebtedness to Jewish acquaintances for past acts of kindness that they chose to reciprocate in the form of aid during the Holocaust. This was especially true in situations where the perceived value of the original gesture was high. Such reciprocated gestures are not surprising. Empirical studies show a strong link between feelings of both gratitude and indebtedness and repayment behavior. What's more, gratitude in particular versus indebtedness has been shown to potentially promote relationship formation and maintenance. The power of gratitude to strengthen Interpersonal relationships is also the very reason that Jews who were rescued during the Holocaust were likely to maintain close friendships with their rescuers after the war, assuming that there were no ge uh, geographic or geopolitical impediments, and often went to great lengths to ensure the latter's stability and comfort, creating a cycle of gratitude and reciprocation between people and their descendants. And interestingly, feelings of gratitude and indebtedness were often so strong in such reciprocation based relationships that they compelled rescuers to extend aid directly to the children or other relatives of those who had once helped them, even in the absence of the original helpers. Am I speaking too quickly? Is, is, I'll, I'll slow down. Can you do that? Okay. So from Ukrainians who repaid Jews for having helped them find employment, to those who helped Jews for having lent them money in the past, or even uh, to Jewish midwives who'd give, helped them give birth in the past, the original acts of kindness that lent themselves to reciprocation could take many forms. But amongst the most compelling stories of wartime rescue work were those in which Ukrainians launched rescue operations as repayment for help extended to them by Jews a decade earlier during the Holodomor, the terror famine of 1932-1933. So since we have limited time, 
I've decided to present a, a single case study, the story of Riva Melstein and the Honchar family. Um, and this case study is especially important to me for several reasons. Um, I discovered Riva's testimony while a student at Cambridge. And um, the first time I listened to it, I was in my room, comically seated on my bed in my pajamas. <laughs> but um, despite this very unconventional setting, um, this episode resides in my memory to this day as an overwhelmingly poignant and emotional experience. And I quickly found myself in tears. Um, not only because I'd realized that I'd come across a very special and powerful motivation for wartime rescue work, but also by the sheer humanity and humility of the rescuer, Honchar, who was motivated to save the lives of three people by an enduring sense of gratitude that he carried in his heart for, for 10 years. And so it, it really, it truly is touching to me to have this opportunity to return to Cambridge to present this particular case study um, and for the very first time to be presenting my research on reciprocated rescue. So I'm just going to start. Um, so here we have uh, the survivor, uh, uh, Riva Milstein. Um, this is her name during the rescue operation. And then we have the Honchar family. And the testimony that I use is from um, the, the younger man who's not in military uniform, I believe, um, who is called Ivan Honchar. Okay, so the Jewish survivor, Riva Milstein, uh, was born in the city of uh, Nemirev in Ukraine's Vinnytsia Oblast on the 10th of September, 1919. Uh, when she was just several months old, her father was killed by bandits at a time when Pog Groms were common in the district. Leaving Rahil, uh, Riva's wid widowed mother, to care for her daughter, her son, who was her eldest son, and her own mother alone. And so Rahil, whose own father had been a very pious man who believed that women should be educated only to the extent necessary to read rel religious texts, studied with the teacher to develop basic literacy in the Russian language in the hope that she might provide for her family. It was very hard for us to get by, and my mother got employment wherever she could, reflected Hidiva in her 1995 testimony to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. One means of employment was the family oil mill. We had an oil mill in our yard. A lot of peasants came to our yard with their seeds, rapeseed, hemp, flax, to grind them at the oil mill. This was mostly in winter, and the peasants would come into our house to rest and warm up. Our house was open to them, said said Riva, and in this way we made the acquaintance of Denis Honchar. In the years that followed, Riva and her older brother continued their studies at school while their mother found employment as an orderly at a hospital in Nemirev. In 1929, Soviet authorities had begun confiscating private farmland into collective property, targeting so-called kulaks or wealthy farmers and their families in rep repressions that claimed millions of victims through arrests, mass deportations, and executions. Residents of the nearby village of Yosipinke, Honchar and his wife, Fyodora, were amongst those affected. The term kulak was used loosely, and often people who had very little were considered wealthy enough to be targeted. Honchar's middle son, Ivan, recalled in his interview with the United States, um, with the USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Library, how did we live? Our family was comprised of ordinary peasants, farmers. What did we have? We had a, strong, a straw house divided into two halves. My father's parents lived in one half, and our family lived in the other half. We had one big room with an earthen floor. There was no flooring, and the space was not divided into rooms. We all lived there together. What did my father have? He had a cow and a horse that he shared with the neighbor and a small plow. That is all that I know. That is all. But for some reason, our family was included in the ranks of those who had to be dekulakized. Riva shared a similar perspective. This man I want to talk about, he was not a kulak as they were called. He was just a good farmer. He had three sons, they all worked in the fields. He ran a good farm. He had a horse, cows, pigs, and geese, she said, before sardonically adding, as if quoting the thoughts of a Soviet official, well, that means he's a kulak and he must be dispossessed. <laughs> 
Decolocization went like this. It meant that everything you had in your house needed to be taken, everything, even clothes. If they saw something that fit, they took clothing away and concluded Riva. Ivan Hanchar re recalled that his parents were invited to join a collective farm in the early 1930s, but refused to do so because they understood that they would need to give everything away. People didn't go there willingly, and certain measures were taken against anyone who resisted, anyone who didn't want to go, he said. When officials threatened Denis Honchar with arrest, he ran away and hid with distant relatives. His wife, Fyodora, was not so fortunate. She was arrested and imprisoned in Bratslav for several months, while their three children were evicted from their home and resettled across the hall in their home of their grandfather. Meanwhile, the Honchar's half of the two-family house was given away to another family that had also been de decolocized and whose own house, conveniently situa situated in the village center, had been requisitioned to become an office for the very kolkhoz that was being established through the collectivization process. This was the year 1932, which saw the start of the Holodomor, the man-made terror famine that killed millions. Ivan's interviewer asked him whether he had memories of 1932 and 1933. Unfortunately, I cannot say that I remember how things were in detail, as I was a boy of seven. But I do remember, replied Ivan. I remember walking along the vegetable garden in early spring of 1933 to get something out of the ground. Sometimes we were lucky. We could find a potato that was left in the ground. Our grandfather would, would mix it with some husk, millet or some other food waste and make some kind of flat bread, Lipyoshka, said Ivan, who also had memories of his father's sisters, Darka and Hrusya, coming over to help cook food for the three children, wash them and otherwise care for them. This is how we survived, he said. The interviewer asks, was it a hungry year? Ivan Hachar replies, it was a terrifying year, a year of cold, of hunger, a terror terrifying year 1993. Many people died in our village, starved to death, but somehow we survived. No one in our family died of hunger, though many people in the village did. Interviewer. <coughs> Ivan Denisovich, why do you think people died of starvation then? Ivan Honchar. Well, what do you mean, why did they die? Because a lot of people were treated just like ours were. Well, uh, our, a lot of families were treated just like ours was. What was there to dispossess a family such as ours of? We were genuinely not wealthy. There was nothing special about this family. Father paid his taxes consistently. He worked very hard. Father and mother both worked hard. And this was true for other people too. And when everything was wiped clean, everything was taken away. They literally shook everything we had out of our family. They shook out the pots and the pans and took everything away. Where could a person find anything to live on then? Ivan recalled that some peasants were able to take the train to western regions of Ukraine to exchange any remaining possessions for a little bit of grain, but not everyone was so lucky. Those who could not go anywhere or procure anything somewhere, dig something out of the veg or dig something out of the vegetable garden, died of starvation, he said. The Holodomor was also difficult for the Milstein family, though they lived not in the countryside but in a town. The family also struggled to procure food. Here is an excerpt from uh, Riva Milstein's interview. A pig farm was set up where the oil mill once stood, and a peasant used to carry the animal's beets boiled in braha, a mixture of grain bill and water left over from alcohol production. He took the beets in this way. He knew that we were hungry, there were four of us, so every night he brought us the same kind of bucket of beets that he would carry for the pigs. Well, my mother watched them and we ate them with my brother. But my grandmother and I, we swelled of hunger. We couldn't eat those beets. I couldn't stand the smell, but we survived. Given his modest holdings, Denis Honchar could not have known that his family would be targeted for decolocization. He most certainly never suspected that he would be hiding and that his wife would be imprisoned while their children suffered through a genocidal famine. But conscious of the general zeitgeist, he took a precaution earlier in the collectivization process that would later prove essential for his family's survival. 
In the year 1932, a peasant came to us, recalled Riva. We had already forgotten about him, as we had many acquaintances, and he asked my mother to guard a bag of grain for him. This was a big, tall bag called a lantuch that could fit five or seven puts of grain, equivalent to 80 to 115 kilograms today. And he asked whether he could, we could keep this bag for him because he would otherwise, because they would otherwise starve, and there would be nothing to sow in the spring because everything had already been taken away. Mama agreed. As the famine raged, the Milsteins starved alongside their Ukrainian neighbors and friends. With Hunchar's grain in their possession, they had a possible lifeline, a means by which to assuage their own hunger, but they chose to keep their word instead. This family turned out to be very honorable. And noble, said Ivan. Denise and Fyodora Honchar both uh, returned home in spring of 1933. With absolutely nothing to cook or to sow, they went in the immediate to the mill chains to con collect the bag of wheat and personal items Denise had left in their, in their care. Honchar came to us and said, Rahil Moiseevna, did you leave a tiny bit of grain for us from what I left you? And Mama replied, what do you mean a tiny bit? Look, your bag is right there where you left it, recalled Riva. When he came up to it and looked, he couldn't believe his eyes. The bag was tied exactly as he tied it up. It hadn't been touched. He went up to Mama, knelt down, and began to kiss her hands. He said, you saved my whole family. We have three sons, an old mother, an old father. You saved us. When Honshar untied the bag, he and Fyodora were also amazed to see that the personal items they'd hidden amongst the grain were also untouched. Not only did they return everything to the last grain, recalled Ivan, they also helped to survive however they could in that very difficult time. It was this first rescue operation that helped sow seeds of friendship, gratitude, and trust between the Honchars and the Milsteins, though the family didn't maintain close relations over the decade that followed. Nearly a decade after the Holodomor, Ukraine was under Nazi occupation, and the Jewish population was being murdered in the Holocaust. Riva and her mother survived the first mass shooting of Jews in Nimiriv by going into hiding in the countryside just a few days earlier at the home of a patient from the hospital where Rahil was working as an orderly. From there, mother and daughter made their way to the regional capital of Vinnytsia, staying with unknown peasants along the way. But rumors of an upcoming massacre cut short their time in Vinnytsia. They decided to return to Nemediv and seek refuge at the home of a Ukrainian neighbor. One day in early 1942, though it was dangerous for Jews to appear out in the open, Riva and her mother ventured to a market where they chanced to meet a woman they'd known before the war. We met a Ukrainian peasant woman called Ksenia Maidanik from a neighboring village. Oh. I know you. You're alive, she said. It seems that there will be another round of killings. Do you have anyone with whom you can hide? The woman asked. I would hide you in my home, but I have two very small children who will immediately tell everyone that we have strangers living with us. So I can't take you, but I'll take you to Honchar, recalled Riva. When I came to Honchar, she continued, he recognized me. Come in, come in, he said. You are the daughter of Rahil. I know why you have come. I told him that there would be another massacre on June 24th. I know, he said. Come on in and wait here, he said before running off. He ran, to his youngest, he ran for his youngest sons. Vanya, Ivan, was 16 years old and Stjopa Stepan was 13 years old. He led them to the yard where I was waiting and said, children, the mother of this girl saved our lives in 1933. It was she who gave us the grain that allowed us to both survive hunger and plant new crops. Now we will save them from the fascists. You will not tell anyone that we have strangers living with us, will you, children? For if anyone learns, we will be shot instantly. You understand that, don't you? No, father, the children said. We won't tell anybody anything. That night, Honchar and his family hid Riva, her mother, Rachel, and her aunt in the family barn. Riva remained there for a month. Upon consultation with Honchar and Fyodora, she decided to go to Vinitsa to see a Russian friend called Valentina, who she hoped would provide her with a falsified document proving that the two were related. 
As a safety precaution, Fyodora dressed Diva in Ukrainian clothing and plaited her hair for the journey. With non-Jewish papers and her blonde hair, Ariva belie believed that she would survive, and indeed she did, eventually even posing as a Volksdeutsche and finding employment at, at, a gendarmerie, at a gendarmerie in a village in the Zhytomyr Oblast. Though Ivan himself first met Ariva in 1942, he said in his interview that their families had been friends since 1933. From the moment Honchar and Fyodora came to collect their bag of grain, and realized that the faith that they'd played in the mills, realized that they had been correct to place their faith in the millsteins. Our families became friends and trusted each other. And when misfortune struck, when the Germans started exterminating the Jews, they came and asked my parents to hide them. This powerful case study and the other case studies of such symbiotic relationships and acts of mutual aid between Jews and Ukrainians examined in my paper not only reconstruct the circumstances of both Jewish-led rescue operations during the Holodomor and Ukrainian-led rescue operations during the Holocaust, exploring the nature of the party's relationship before, during, between, and after the two events, but they also reveal that both the Holodomor and the Holocaust were multi-ethnic experiences in Soviet Ukraine, in experiences in which one group managed to leverage certain advantages to help alleviate the suffering of the other, which was targeted as a primary victim group. Thank you. Thank you, it's my honor to be here and to follow these really fascinating papers. I feel in some way that I'm in an interloper to Holodomor studies. Um, I'm a historian of education and a historian of childhood. And I wrote a book called Breaking the Tongue on Ukrainization uh, in the 1920s on schools. And I'm engaged in a project right now on street children in Odessa from the late imperial period up to the present. And that's, in many ways, how uh, both these perspectives, both these studies sort of inform this particular contribution to our uh, distinguished conference, to our distinguished uh, discussion of the history of the Holodomor. So I feel in some ways I'm responding to Dr. Maddenly's charge to fit the Holodomor within the context of Soviet history. That's really what I intend to do with this paper. All right, I'd like to begin with a quote by uh, Ivan Deshkevich, who is a former teacher in the Poltava region. Uh, he wrote, pleading to Hikhoroi Petrovsky, the head of the Ukrainian Soviet government tortures a terrible hunger made artificially. An artificial hunger causes anger, hatred, greed, distrust, deviousness, deception, and many ba other bad things in people. Oh, how terrible, terrible to die from torture. In this quote, uh, I suggest he recognizes famine for what it is, right? The Holodomor for what it is. It's an artificially imposed hunger. And he makes his plea to Petrovsky on the basis of his long service as a Soviet teacher and a teacher before the Soviet period as well. I don't know a great amount about him. Um, but uh, but he claims in the letter he's been teaching for 35 years and he pleads, he begs for any sort of help on the basis of the fact that he had been a teacher of the people and more importantly, perhaps an inspirer of socialism. He had accepted the Soviet charge to, um, to train the next generation, the first generation really of Soviet Ukrainians. And I think this quote in many ways, or this letter as a whole, exposes the contradictions of Soviet educational and welfare policy 
that we need to understand in order to understand the place of children in the famine and the lack of a Soviet plea for foreign assistance. And so I ask a really quite simple question, why is it inconceivable that foreign aid, uh, why was it inconceivable that foreign aid might be sought again in the 1932-33 Holodomor as it had been sought before? It could have been conceivably in the name of children like those who had been under Desh, uh, Deshkevich's charge. So Soviets had asked for help famously in the 1921 to 1923 famine. They were not above asking for foreign assistance in their own um, economic and industrial projects. And so I, I suppose we might respond simply and say the Soviets were an insular state and they were protective uh, about um, imagery associated with their achievements. But I think in many ways, at least informed by my own broader research, that at the heart of it, for the Soviets, people like Deshkevich give lie to the um, contradictions in children's welfare and education policy, right? The Soviets had built an amazing network of schools and children's buildings designed to prevent such a thing as famine um, happening on such a scale, and yet it did, and starvation was happening in the very institutions that the Soviets had created or expanded. I should say also by way of preliminary remarks, um, I, I hesitate to give too much, but um, this project was, uh, this um, conference paper was inspired by a series of uh, documents that Sadavo put on its site in November of 1920, uh, uh, excuse me, November of 2021, so of last, uh, last year, many of which um, have actually already appeared in print and have been published. Um, and that's, uh, there's so much, I think, still to be gained. I was excited to see the original documents uh, online, but there's still so much we can pursue from documents that are, um, that have long been available uh, to historians. So I'm, I'm using the original documents for this um, paper, but also the uh, published record of those documents, which are in many ways easier to read because the original documents are often handwritten uh, to put together this conference paper. So this is an image from my book of children in the Cherkasi region together with their teachers um, in a rural setting, uh, obviously a rural school. And I'd suggest this is the kind of place that Dashkevich um, was employed or had been employed. So, as we know, um, a, a famine occurred uh, in 1921 to 1923. Uh, conventionally in the field, I think uh, it's thought of as a famine affecting the Volga provinces, but for those of us, I think most of us in the room understand it severely impacted Ukraine, in particular southern Ukraine, and in my own research in Odessa, um, uh, children were coming from the Volga region to seek refuge in Soviet children's institutions in the city of Odessa, right? So the famine is not just affecting the children of southern Ukraine, but children from other parts of the Soviet Union were coming to Soviet Ukraine to um, receive assistance. And of course, the Soviets were not beyond asking for foreign aid with this particular famine. Gorky issued this famous appeal to all honest European and American people to provide food to relieve the victims of famine. The international community responded. Um, the ICRR, joint uh, Jewish-oriented uh, um, international aid agency and the American Relief Administration. And uh, we have this quite um, well-known book, um, by Bertrand Patenaud, uh, a huge book um, on this, uh, this first Soviet famine, the big show in Bololan. And what's interesting to me is that the aid that the ARA in particular provided to Ukraine was premised on leveraging the victimhood of children, right? Children 
justified um, the ARA's presence, aid to children justified the ARA's presence in, um, in Ukraine, in Soviet Ukraine, and helping children also enabled the ARA to gather funds that were necessary to provide this aid. And this is where the ARA began its work, right? As, um, as Patanod uh, writes, children's kitchens, which the ARA preferred to set up independently, but often put in Soviet children's, build, uh, children, children's buildings or children's homes, acted as what he calls effective lubricants for wider food packages distributed to the general Soviet Ukrainian population. But aid began first with children before it was expanded beyond that. And of course, um, the image of a suffering child uh, and the ARA relief to a suffering child um, made for a good um, uh, media exposure uh, for the ARA and also obviously justified the ARA's presence again in Soviet Ukraine. So um, even though the ARA provided uh, independently set up kitchens, uh, they often had to turn to Soviet children's homes or deep budinki to actually distribute this aid. Um, and these children's homes were massively expanded during this um, famine and in the period thereafter. They became distributors of food. They were obviously shelter, uh, uh, places of shelter and refuge for children orphaned by the famine. Um, but they, as well as conventional schools, I would argue to you, were never just this. Um, uh, the Soviets intended them to be places not just of refuge and, and shelter, but of transformation. Transformation so that these children, semi-orphaned, orphaned and abandoned, would become part of a proletarian socialist family writ, writ large. Um, and uh, this is the direction that I think we need to appreciate in understanding the place of such institutions during the whole Holodomor. So quite famous images that I'm sure some of you have seen. Um, the ARA, uh, an ARA poster intended for a Soviet audience, right, revealing the generosity of Americans to children specifically. And uh, imagery, there's quite horrific imagery of children suffering in this famine. I've chosen to crop, crop um, this particular image, but you get the idea of the extent of children's suffering. So the Soviets should have known better, right? Is my, one of my um, arguments that uh, when famine came again, it would inevitably uh, harm greatly the most vulnerable population in the Soviet Union and Soviet Ukraine specifically, um, children. And it could have motivated them to issue appeals for foreign aid. I think a, a damning but revealing report um, was issued by the uh, Soviet um, uh, Ukrainian government by Radnikom in January 1929, where Radnikom is looking in particular at this report um, about the need to help children specifically. And they um, reveal that although they initially gained some money from um, Sovnakom from the all union uh, Soviet authorities in, in Moscow to help provide aid to uh, uh, children in the southern steppe area of Ukraine. They actually need to expand um, their work and they use the initial tranche of money to uh, expand this work to additional for Okruhi um, adjacent to the original targeted area of, uh, of assistance. And even this is not enough. So they're making use of what they can and they're actually sort of watering down the aid as it applies to every individual child. They need to use the initial sum to help more children, um, but they find that this cannot be enough, that they need to ask Moscow for more, more support for a larger number of children, um, more support to get better food so children actually don't suffer because of nutritional deficiencies, 
and more support so that the rations can be continued uh, until June of um, that year, just imagining, um, uh, I suppose, a shorter time range for what they confronted. But the point is they certainly understood what was upon them. And uh, I think what is interesting in this document is that they express regret, that is the writers of this Rodner Common Report, they express regret that they can only help poor children and most of the lower strata of the middle class, or it doesn't provide, in fact, aid for all poor children and all the lower strata of the middle class. So they understood that even the sort of um, politically accepted uh, rationale of providing for the poorest children is not being met. And of course, the reality uh, we know that was just told to us um, just now by Raisa, um, uh, in fact, there's not a huge socioeconomic differentiation in the Soviet Ukrainian countryside, uh, and they must have appreciated the fact that even recipients of the of their aid, um, children who receive this aid, would have known of the suffering of other children. There's just not. It's hard to divide the children's population into poor children and the lower strata of the middle class, certainly as it applies to rural Ukraine. So a quite famous photo of a um, export grain silo in Mykolaiv. of this kinds of resources that uh, initially were available um, could have been tapped um, by Ukrainian Republican authorities, but they needed authorization from Moscow in order to do so. So um, what happens then uh, as the supplies begin to wane um, is there is a blame game that happens, but it's centered, I would argue to you, about the issue of children's welfare. Um, uh, so I looked at this report by uh, the Vekno Dniprovsk um, District Executive Committee from April of 1931, and they look at a um, children's town or Mistechko in uh, in Vekno Dniprovsk, and they're astonished to find that their own decrees, as well as the decrees of the local party um, cells, are being ignored as it regards to supplying children in this children's town, a Soviet institution created with the at least initial premise or the baseline expectation that children would not suffer from hunger um, and that they would be cared for, that children in this Soviet institution were, um, were, uh, were starving. Uh, so they blame local supply organizations. It's the usual sort of um, game. Uh, and they demand that this children's town be placed on the um, Republican uh, level budget um, because children's towns at that time were famously uh, reliant on local budgets. Um, to me, of course, reading these documents, these bureaucratic documents, as a historian, you, you understand what's at work. There, the, or, there's a realization, perhaps, that there's simply not enough food uh, to go around and some children will starve, um, uh, but, uh, but somebody has to be held uh, accountable. All right. Um, but these governmental Soviet authorities recognize in this document that a crime is being committed, that a crime is being committed against children. So they call for authorities in Kharkiv to intervene to put a stop to this negligent criminal behavior, um, uh, criminal relationship as it regards children. All right, this is from my own research in Odessa. I don't have a picture of this particular children's town that I just referenced, but this is a quite famous children's town. Um, the first Comintern children's town in Odessa, and who is at the center of this document or this photo, um, none other but Hilary Petrovsky, who's the recipient of so many pleas for aid. All right, I'm going to necessarily go um, uh, 
uh, a bit beyond my commentary here. Uh, there's a lot of letters from children. Um, uh, and I think what is fascinating about these letters is that children are asking for help, often from Petrovsky. Um, they're asking him directly. Um, but they're, they're, in effect, in so many words, saying, uh, you have not honored your promise to us. This is far from the era of prosperity and progress. Uh, in fact, it doesn't seem all that different from what our parents would have faced before. Um, two images, uh, one of which uh, I'm sure everyone in the room knows, another also drawn from my book, um, explaining the way that seeks to demonstrate the way in which Soviet lessons were told to children. So there's a certain truth to be understood, I think, on the part of children in the children's own minds of, of what their situation would be. And obviously, there's a huge discrepancy. Excuse me. Um, uh, it's the actual letter that I um, that I uh, just talked about. So there were places to go to besides state state resources. There is this Society for the Friends of Children, um, and on occasion, leaders of children's uh, institutions, such as children's buildings or children's towns, or um, directors of school would uh, appeal for help from this society. But I would like to submit to you that it's sort of a, a shell game that has to happen in the absence of wide scale foreign assistance, right? Um, uh, it's a charitable organization run by Soviet citizens, but essentially um, uh, it is being kept afloat by dues plays, play, um, paid by Soviet uh, Ukrainian citizens. So they're taking from their own salary um, at the very same time that they're facing the prospect of starvation themselves. Um, but what is telling to me is that uh, these appeals are made partly on the premise that simply the state could not do enough and there is no foreign aid to be had, so where else do you turn? I'm going to go quickly um, to this last slide and then offer some brief concluding remarks. Much of this information is well known and would be familiar to you as well. But I think what we need to be reminded, um, lest I be accused of, of not saying something new, um, is that um, that all this, all this foreign, uh, many of these uh, observations by foreigners focus on children, right? On the aid that should have been happening for children and the fact that the Soviets are obscuring the large numbers of homeless children that foreigners inevitably con confront in cities like uh, Kharkiv. I would be remiss if I quickly <laughs> bypassed this one bullet point at the very end of my slide, um, uh, where Don Shetichka, my student, has done some really admirable work saying that children themselves made appeals to foreign um, charitable organizations for aid. So children understood what was at stake and were appealing directly. But the point is the Soviet government wasn't and they understood what the problem was and tried to eliminate any need for foreign assistance by um, cleaning the streets of street children. We've talked about this gentleman several times over. Um, I think it's telling that there's a photo of him uh, with a child. And of course, he visited a um, model children's um, colony, I think it was, or um, uh, perhaps it was a children's building in, in the city of Kharkiv. So he's, the Soviets are assuring him everything is okay as it regards children. All right, lastly, I know I'm stretching your patience here with time, is uh, a few concluding remarks, is that in my view, Soviet legitimacy was at least part based on the idea that they would offer a better future for, for children, right? This is certainly what they were doing in Ukrainian language, Soviet schools um, that have been the subject of my study and children's 
um, institutions in the city of Odessa, which are the subject of my current research. Uh, and Ukrainians made, Soviet Ukrainian officials made a big deal about the achievements that they were having in um, regards to educational policy. And thus, there was a huge contradiction between the sort of boastful promise, although some of it, I'd suggest, is true regarding uh, literacy achieved. Um, but children clearly, in the context of the Holodomor, were starving in the very institutions that the Soviets had um, created to offer ret refuge for children. And uh, secret police were engaged in these campaigns to uh, um, detain, arrest, um, and then um, dispose of children. Some were offered some sort of assistance, but the point was um, that uh, regulation and surveillance really replaced the missions of rescue uh, and salvation. And so I'd like to end with uh, a famous, I think, at least my view, um, in my world, it's a pretty famous quote by one of the witnesses to the Holodomor, uh, a teacher who kept a diary of the Holodomor years, Alexandra uh, Rachenko, who uh, I think tells us really all we need to know, uh, or at least seems to encapsulate my thought here in, um, in a revealing way. The poor things, and it is for them that socialism is being prepared. Funny, some kind of comedy, right? So socialism had this potential, had this promise, and yet these poor things, these children's children are dying under the circumstances of socialism as it's being realized in 1932-33. And uh, as a father, further picture of contrast, um, Rodchenko's photo together with Mikola Skripnik, Commissar of Education, famously under uh, the period of Ukrainization of schools, surrounded, of course, by children. Right? This is <laughs> this is what Soviet life in the present and future is supposed to be. And then we know the reality of what it became and how it's being remembered today. I thank you for your patience. Take care. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Rory Finn, and I'm Associate Professor of Ukrainian Studies here at Cambridge. And I just want to welcome you all uh, to Cambridge, to Robinson College. As Carolina said before, it's lovely to have people in person together. Um, we're really grateful for your time and your input. And I'd like to thank our three presenters today for really rich, um, archivally sourced um, uh, uh, papers and presentations drawing on a vast array of different sources, different disciplinary perspectives. And um, I'm going to actually just begin by um, expressing my solidarity with the people of Ukraine right now, um, and to mention how many of our colleagues, of course, um, working on Holodomor and Holodomor studies uh, can't be with us here, can't leave Ukraine. Um, and I just know that I'm, I'm, I'm probably sharing um, your views as well, that we don't accept this as a new normal. We don't take it for granted. Um, I'm going to abbreviate my comments, because I want to make sure we have time for Q&A with all of you. Um, I will say what we've seen here are three different papers that, uh, in Carolina's words, offer counter knowledge uh, about uh, Holodomor. On the one hand, we saw in the previous panel um, a focus on dispelling, to a degree, this invisibility myth um, that the Holodomor was not seen by contemporaries in 1932-33 in the surrounding years. Um, we have um, a great deal of that same message in these presentations, but we also have um, another kind of counter narrative, and that is focusing on compassion. So histories of Holodomor often um, look past this question of solidarity and compassion. These are papers that in various ways, um, with overlapping almost palimpsestic forms of solidarity, um, look to um, connections between peoples, and given that this is a, uh, a conference on framing Holodomor in a global perspective, um, I want us to think about um, this conceptually, if we can, um, by way of a kind of compassionate crossing of boundaries. Um, in the first case, um, we have with Matt Pauly's presentation, um, the uh, question of intra uh, 
state relationships, how the state has certain moral and political obligations, particularly to children, that it does not fulfill. So intrastate. In the case of Carolina's paper, we have interstate relations. So Ukrainians in the diaspora, in Poland in particular, actively raising awareness about Holodomor and seeking to offer humanitarian uh, aid in result uh, and in response. And then we have inter-ethnic relations, those between Ukrainians and Jews within the same state. Um, so varying degrees here, I think, of um, conceptual perspectives that we can take with this question of solidarity and this crossing of borders, uh, emotional, ethnic, and, and political. So I want to begin with, with Matt's presentation because it's focusing again on the question of what the state owes children. Um, and you mentioned, Matt, how in 1921-23 uh, that the famine was, um, was, was framed by way of this figure of the, the child victim. So my first question is about whose child? Um, you talk a great deal about the children's homes and orphans. Um, and I'm curious here about the role of the family and the presentation of the child having lost a family. Um, whose child? Uh, is it? You spend a lot of time focusing, I think, really productively on how the Soviet Ukrainian government could see the famine coming, particularly given the experience of the 1920s. Um, you have cited a number of sources of authorities alerting Moscow and the Kremlin um, to the, the coming storm. And then you have these remarkable texts from uh, children, children's letters to Vucevica, uh, in 1931 in particular, as you pointed, oblique, uh, obliquely skewering Soviet myth-making. And I just have a, um, a really kind of digressive question about um, your own sense of the authenticity of these letters from children. At one point, um, you quote uh, the children saying, um, uh, we hope that the Soviet government will not let us perish and will not feed us sheaths of reeds instead of bread as the czars fed our fathers. There's a really robust kind of historical frame here um, that of course could have very well come from erudite children, but also I'm interested in whether children were used as a vessel through which elites themselves inside the Soviet state and particularly in Soviet Ukraine expressed concerns and protests. And then of course, your, your thesis, which is in the claim here in the presentation, which is that of course, um, the difference between 1921 to 1923 and then 1932 to 33. Um, and why, the, 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 the troubling, disturbing, horrific question of why the Soviet regime did not act um, when indeed that same child victim um, was present and in greater numbers, in fact. Uh, I'm thinking of one of the sources actually in Karolina's presentation, uh, Vasil Mudri, who put it this way, um, hundreds of thousands of our brothers have already died from starvation. This means that they want this famine for Ukraine. If not, why do they deny it? So one of the questions I have for you in this, in this context is, uh, it could very well be answered that the reason why um, the Soviets did not act to save children in 1932-33 was not necessarily to give lie to anything, because of course the question is the audience, right? So everyone inside the Soviet Union could see um, that children were starving and that people were starving. The question becomes, what audience is being deceived here and why? Um, and perhaps it's not deception at all, but actually um, uh, brazen intention to, to, to kill and to destroy. Uh, that leads me to uh, Karolina's paper, um, very fascinating discussion of the Ukrainsky Hromatsky Komitet Ratyunku uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian Civil Committee for Saving Ukraine. You are very persuasive and clear about how the common assumption that the famine uh, was an event that did not see uh, organized humanitarian aid, how in fact that was not true, it's not quite accurate. Um, you focus a great deal on uh, works like Mudri's in alerting different Ukrainian communities in Poland and Holocena and beyond um, to the famine. I'm really interested here in the question of that aid itself. So if it is the case that um, uh, there, were, there were indeed efforts to provide humanitarian aid, how and where did it go? Um, this was something that I'm just fascinated by and would appreciate just out of ignorance um, uh, more information about. And then finally, hurrying through to Raisa's presentation, uh, a remarkable story uh, of two families. 
um, uh, the Mirstein family and the Honchar family, um, and this focus on both uh, Holodomor and the Holocaust. And it's worth putting these two events together in a frame. Uh, Carolina, you have, of course, the story of Cardinal uh, Initzer, um, and I'm very interested in whether uh, Card Cardinal Inister, to, uh, to your knowledge, uh, collaborated all with Cardinal Pacelli, the future Pope Pius XII, who was very active, um, as we know, um, during the period of the Holocaust and was not as active in recognizing it and, 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 uh, and contesting it, and whether or not Pacelli um, had some practice, as it were, in ignoring the horrors of the Holocaust because he was involved in ignoring the horrors of the Holodomor. Um, but uh, Raisi, I'm interested in this question of reciprocity, because you focus a great deal here on questions of um, strategies of coping uh, to trauma among Jewish and Ukrainian communities. Um, you do a wonderful job showing um, that this wartime suspension of the norm of social responsibility did not apply in these particular cases. We're seeing right now in the war in Ukraine, um, a lot of uh, ways Ukrainian people are contesting that norm, that somehow uh, during war we suspend these social obligations to neighbors. Um, the case study that you uh, bring to our attention is really vibrant in this regard. But back to the question of reciprocity, because that's a question that can cut a number of ways. Um, and so I'm very interested in how you, within a conceptual frame, think about reciprocity to past harm, as well as to acts of generosity. Because we do have accounts of um, various communities thinking back to harm that Jews or Ukrainians did to each other, justifying uh, violence in the present. How does one tell both those stories within the same frame? Um, it's obviously a great challenge. So sorry to rush through a number of points and remarks. I very much appreciate your papers. So if you have any initial responses to what I've just mentioned, super. Um, and then I'll open the floor to um, questions from the audience, and if it's okay, John and Daria, I'll stand up here and then maybe point out who's who's ready with a question. Okay, so if anyone would like to tackle my own, I'd be grateful to hear from you. I, I, I'm happy to, although I'll do so briefly because I'm rather long-winded. <laughs> um, so, uh, whose child to be saved in the 1921-23 famine or, or the, thereafter? Um, I think it's a legitimate question i would just say uh, uh of course uh, all these children um did have families right so <laughs> there's a loss of family that happens and the soviet um state intervenes specifically to help the, these children who have lost families so that's their first priority and then one can suggest perhaps cynically, that the loss of the family for the Soviets wasn't always such a bad thing, right? The family is perceived as a sort of inheritance of the bourgeois past, and the state is much better positioned to raise these children in the way that the state thought uh, was best. So obviously the family holds together um, and then is put under stress again during the whole Holodomor. So I don't mean to suggest the Soviets were out to destroy all families, it's just they didn't shed so many tears when families, particularly families that were having a negative influence over children, um, were fractured. I think authenticity of letters, uh, I, uh, I have a brief line in the, in the written form where I um, suggest there's, there could be doubts about this. Um, the way in which, I, you know, the, the quote that you made um, and that I used in my presentation references um, the past, the czar's past, of course, these children would have known that past, so that suggests something about the structured nature of their memory, um, but it's just hard to, to know for sure, and I, I think a good proportion of letters um, uh, should still, we should proceed from the assumption that children's voices are somehow represented in these letters, even if it's done through the hand, perhaps, of a school director. Um, and then uh, just l lastly, uh, categories of, of children uh, as it regards uh, Soviet intent here, uh, I suggest, of course, that certain children could be sacrificed in the Soviet effort, right? So the children, so famously of Kulaks, again, were not children that the, the Soviets 
um, worried uh, about. But I do think the famine has such a wide effect that it, it really destabilizes Soviet power and Soviet society. And uh, children of elites may have survived, but children um, who are not quite in the upper echelons of the party are also under risk as well. So I, I, I would be reluctant to say that the Soviets simply decided that uh, the children's population of Ukraine as a whole um, could be done, done away with. And then Anne um, Applebaum in this book that everyone has to read now, um, if they're interested in the famine, uh, makes a good point, I think, uh, that some children do in fact survive because they're put in these shelters. I think it's striking that so many die in the shelters, but um, the Soviets take their construction seriously. They can uh, take the um, possibility of disease spreading within these institutions and then from these institutions the Soviet public at large seriously um, and that uh, that influences their efforts um, so I, I wouldn't be uh, so inclined to write off um, Soviet uh, Soviet care thank you Matt great mm -hmm. race or Carolina Oh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for uh, for your comments and for questions. Um, yeah, I think that my jet lag is hitting me, <laughs> so I might be a little bit more messy than I am usually. Um, so these are these are great questions, and I think like a very interesting way to put our um, papers together. Um, so so ab about the the actual aid um, and where did it go? Um, I mean, like, of course, uh, the Ukrainian committee, as well as uh, many other committees, they collected money um, um, during numerous occasions. Like, I mean, most of the money actually uh, were used uh, for the internal work of these committees. Uh, so, for example, Modri, Modri's book, uh, at some point, it was, um, you know, distributed not only to like every district town in Galicia, but actually every village. So it cost money to like print the book, and there were like two other books. Uh, that follow. Uh, that being said, the day uh, of mourning and protest was an important fundraising uh, fundraising event as well. Um, so, in the documents of the Ukrainian committee, we can find some bits and pieces of like how uh, much money they were able to collect. Um, and most of this money could be sent, or most of the funds could be sent only through some uh, individual money transfers. Um, um, and we have also, like in the in the documents of the Ukrainian committee, we also have like many telegrams um, and money transfers, um, like sent, for example, from I don't know different um, different cities uh, in Poland. Um, so, th so, so there was a clearly the component of like you know raising funds um, for the starving. Of course, like uh, in the case of the committees that were uh, established like, closer to the border, like in Chernivtsi. Uh, or um, uh, or in uh, in Bucharest, uh, most of this money would come to the refugees um, and and providing some help uh, for them. But I think that none of this can really um, we we can we, we cannot really compare none of this um, uh, attempts with uh, what you know Soyuz Ukraino Kamereki did uh, in 1934. Uh, because this was really um, this was really the moment of this um, much more where um, like much better organized like fundraising campaigns like all over the states. But like again, it was like sent through some uh, individual money transfers um, to the Soviet uh, Soviet Ukraine. Um, so I would say like yes, I mean there the, the, there was question of um, of this actual aid um, uh, being said, but still I think that. Um, most of these committees really worked on um, the public awareness campaign and the recognition of the famine. Uh, and about the Cardinal Initzer um, slash um, uh, Pacelli and, and Holocaust, to be honest, I mean, like, I didn't really look at this uh, connection. I think that this is something really interesting. And the reason, I mean, like in my, in my dissertation, I kind of look at the instrumentalization of famine in the Nazi propaganda. It's like important part of the story. But then like very quickly in my dissertation, I kind of follow the survivors of the famine uh, to the United States. And I trace this kind of multi-directional relation between Holocaust um, and Holodomor in this kind of early Cold War period and how they kind of you know, um, mutually uh, inform one another. So I kind of um, 
skipped a little bit the European part of politics. But I think that this is uh, this is something um, something might be interesting here um, to discover um, when it comes to like Second World War and how like both narratives kind of um, spoke to one another. So thank you for this suggestion. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Lisa. Thank you very much for this important question. It's it's so difficult to respond to this question. Um, I'm going to try to pull as briefly as I can at several disciplines to try to just use several concepts, pre-existing concepts that might help enlighten this. So. Um, uh, the type of rescue operations that I um, was looking at in this paper uh, specifically are motivated by, well, this is an example of rescue operations by pre-existing relations. So um, approximately 70% of all uh, rescue operations in uh, Nazi-occupied Ukraine by Ukrainians of Jewish victims were um, fell into the pre-existing relations category as opposed to the just random chance encounter type of rescue work. Um, and so pre-existing relations uh, can be divided into numerous subcategories. For instance, um, you could have relations as relationship as neighbors, as colleagues. So the various motivations that fall into this category could be love, friendship, respect, and gratitude for me um, is, is in, in a very powerful manifestation of this phenomenon as well. And so all um, rescue operations based on pre-existing relations um, were largely motivated by something um, that had been cultivated. And this thing that was cultivated was social trust. And if we look at political science, social trust can be divided into numerous categories. So there's personalized, personalized trust that human beings have between themselves on a personal level that's based on experience of, of positive reinforcement or um, of reliable history of, of showing up for one another. Then we have particularized trust, which could be good because that's the reason that Ukraine is united right now on the basis of some kind of identity factor, but it's also the basis of, of nationalism and justifying the suffering of, for instance, entire um, ethnic groups on the basis of othering. So that could be very dangerous as well. And then we have generalized trust that emerges from personalized trust, but it's this possibly naive, but possibly very uh, important and, and touching um, ability to think that human beings generally can be trusted within a society and that even people you don't know who are distant from you will act in accordance with good values when necessary. So why am I mentioning all of this? I'm mentioning all of this because it seems to me that um, so many, well, all of these stories that I mentioned, especially this one, is is just so strongly manifests the importance of personalized trust and love, and that's the foundation of reciprocation, the willingness to do that. And so with regard to um, just vindictiveness in war, we see that there are really no limits to human cruelty, the things that people are willing to justify the violence against individual humans on a personalized level on the basis of particularized biases. So often we have two types of um, vengeful action against people. So it could be particularized, whereas you, where you say, well, um, my ethnic group or my religious group has been targeted viciously by these people in the past. So what's happening to them now is sort of justified. So that's a particular type of a particularized, I suppose, intellectual justification for violence. And then at the same time, you have personal vendettas when people target individual humans that they just dislike or or have been uh, trespassed against in the past. And so here we have in this category a personalized lack of recipro uh, reciprocation, whereas here we have a particularized lack of reciprocation. And so I, it's hard to respond to the question because it's so complex and it, it really depends on the particular circumstances. But it's, it's shocking sometimes when you talk to people to hear all of these horrible cognitive biases that cloud their minds about this is this only happened once but once a ukrainian rescuer who was um who rescued jews during the holocaust and she was actually 
recognized as righteous among the nations. And in an interview in her old age with, with me in um, Rivne, she said something a bit weird. And I don't know if this is because of her old age or because she always felt this way, but she said that technically, I mean, the Holocaust could be punishment for the Jews for the crime of deicide and uh, the, a very old um, myth. But anyway, why am I, the point I'm trying to make ultimately is that um, the people who were able to transcend all of these biases um, were very much motivated in this context by, like I said, personalized trust that just was so much more powerful and that enabled them also to transcend um, uh, biases that exist on a particularized level within their society in which they existed. Whereas people who didn't reciprocate and went out of their way to perpetrate, but through this lens of vengeance, they had the same cognitive biases that any perpetrators or even a lot of bystanders had. And that was basically morally disengaging and finding intellectualizations and rationalizations, whatever was appropriate for them to justify their actions. Um, it's very easy to forget about social responsibility in a dangerous situation because you morally disengage. And what makes these human beings exceptional is that they're capable of snapping out of that and transcending it all. Well said. Well, thank you very much. Um, you have to forgive me because I did pledge to you that we would take questions from the floor, but we've run out of time, sadly. So I'm sorry to break my promise. It says, it says something about the nature of these three papers that we have so much to discuss. I hope you'll continue these discussions over lunch. Uh, in the meantime, would you please join me in thanking Karolina Kozura, uh, Raisio Ostapenko, and uh, Matthew Pauly, please, for their presentations.